Our first guest will return to Parliament once it gets back in session in late November. We welcome Tony Baldinelli to our studio. Tony, first off, I don't believe I've publicly had a chance to congratulate you on your re-election September 20th. Well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here, Mike, and, and thank you for, for that. It uh, was a hard-fought uh, victory. Uh, all these campaigns are, are, are hard. You have to work uh, tremendously with a dedicated team, and uh, we were fortunate enough uh, to to be victorious on uh, on election night. And with the confusion of the online ballots and, and all of that stuff, um, I have to basically confess on air here, after we signed off, I went to your um, gathering. Yeah. I'm not going to call it your headquarters because it really wasn't. And, and you were very gracious. Climate you would change. not accept yeah. and make your speech until you knew for sure that it was in the bag, which was almost midnight. Yeah, well, we're probably a little up past midnight. Well, I mean, I'm respectful for my colleagues who who ran against me and uh, for, uh, the, you know, their hope was to win as well. So until those final numbers came in and then we knew that there was no way that uh, anyone else, even when the mail-in ballots were counted, uh, could uh, uh, beat me, then then I was uh, able to, to accept uh, the victory. And now we're getting back to work yeah. soon. One of the items on your agenda is this whole idea of support for mental health. Can you tell me about the letter that you and Dean Allison have sent to Chair Jim Bradley? Yeah, uh, thank you for that, Mike. I mean, if, if anything, COVID has shown, I mean, uh, the issue of mental health is, is something that needs uh, greater attention brought to it. Um, and I mean, we, in fact, as part of our, our, our policy platform during the election campaign, made it a central plank in our platform in, in the creation of a, a mental health action plan. And so what we wanted to do was support the efforts that are taking place here regionally to ensure that, you know, by declaring that state of emergency, that we can then go to the federal government and say, listen, here in Niagara, there are issues that need the attention uh, of the federal government, be homelessness, uh, be it actions uh, with mental health, the opioid uh, crisis. All three of those Huge. work together. In fact, they do. I mean, do you, I mean, it's, it's staggering to know that Every day, 17 people will die in Canada because of an opioid uh, overdose. I mean, uh, COVID has uh, increased uh, opioid addictions and uh, fatalities by, what, what, 90%? So that needs to be addressed mental health issues. Those need to be uh, worked on and looked into. I mean, my colleague, even before the election, Todd Doherty, had been advocating for, and we had a motion passed in the House to create a nine, uh, like a three digit. Three digit number for suicide prevention. Prevention hotline. And so that has the support of all members of the House of Commons. So now that we're returning, those are things that we'd like to see begin to be implemented. Why is declaring a state of emergency on mental health important? Again, from our standpoint, it allows us to then go to the federal government and say, listen, we've got an emergency that's taking place in our community. We need action now. When you look at the fact that this has already come up and, and it was really sort of pushed aside the state of emergency, uh, they had decided, the region yeah. had decided not to go with the state of emergency, but basically stressed that it is an issue. Why do you think that happened? You know, I can't speak for the regional uh, vote that took place earlier, but I mean, I think the emergency declaration, because it's more uh, more expansive, it talks to the, the opioid crisis, it talks about housing issues, it talks about mental health issues. So just, I mean, it, 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 it's a greater issue than just one that dealt with housing that I think the, the, the region talked about. And so I'm glad to see that they're gonna be reviewing it again on Thursday. Another issue that certainly is hot on your plate is the border yeah. to the U.S. And finally, it's opening us, uh, opening up for us to go across to the United States. What needs to be done to make sure this is all done safely? Well, we've always advocated, even before the election, that we implement anything that we implement be safe and a responsible border reopening plan. So the Americans, we've uh, allowed them to start coming over for those fully vaccinated beginning in the summertime. So now beginning on November 8th, Canadians can finally begin to cross the land border again. Uh, and the, But uh, there's still, we the, the one issue of concern for many people is that pre-departure uh, testing requirement. I mean, the federal government in the springtime, uh, last November, if we go back to the last November, they created uh, an expert advisory panel to assist them and provide recommendations on how they should go about, you know, with things such as reopening the border. And they, at that time, the, the report came out in May, and this is the group that had advocated 
and telling the government, you don't need a hotel quarantine. Uh, there's no science to, to justify its right. re retention and being in place. And they advocated at the time, and this is going back to the springtime, that if you're fully vaccinated, there should be no pre-departure testing requirement put in place. But the government didn't take that advice and then instead has the pre-departure testing requirement. So, I mean, from a, a standpoint of a border community, for those affected, I've got residents who are married Canadians, live in Niagara Falls. All they're going to do is check on their elderly parents. I mean, how does, uh, you can't do that without having to incur that cost of a pre-departure It's a real issue account. because it's oh, not cheap. For local, for local residents, um, sometimes I, I think, you know, governments fail to realize the integrations that really take place in our border communities. How highly integrated we are. For example, my uncle who brought my mom's family all to Canada, he ended up marrying an American in the 1960s, just moved over to Amherst. He passed away in the springtime uh, of old age. Uh, and you but couldn't go to the funeral. We couldn't go to the funeral, but now to take my mom just to go visit, you know, the site, go to the mausoleum, see my aunt, it's price prohibitive just to, you know, for a couple of hours. And we, we're all fully vaccinated, so we can do that. But I mean, those are issues that, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that, and, uh, you know, the government has said they're, they're gonna be uh, looking into. But again, everything that we do has to be based on, the, on that responsible and safe. Parliament's not going back until past the mid-November mark. That's a frustration for you. Oh, incredibly frustrating. Uh, I'm going to be doing my swearing-in ceremony on Monday, uh, October 25th. But these are the type of issues that we're talking about right now, Mike. We should be on the floor of the House of Commons talking about them right now. Why is it that it's two months after the election campaign that we can't raise those issues? Uh, in fact, we'll probably have a new cabinet uh, announced next week. Uh, so again, there'll be new ministers, new people have to be briefed, right. new people have to come up to speed on issues. So we're almost starting from square one again. Uh, and instead we should be working to resolve the issues that we're, we're, we're discussing right now. I hear your frustration, Tony. I am happy that you're here in your constituency though and yeah. able to come and visit us today. Thanks for the chat. No, my pleasure, Mike, anytime.